They're walking around the streets of London free as birds. I also sat down with a guy who many people consider Great Britain's most hated man. His name is Anjum Chowdhury, and as you'll see, he's not shy about sharing his jihadist beliefs. Both George W. Bush and Barack Obama have declared that Islam is a religion of peace. Anjum Chowdhury begs to differ. You can't say that uh, Islam is a religion of peace because Islam it does not mean peace. Islam is uh, it means it's Islam submission. So the Muslim is the one who submits. You know, there's a place for violence in Islam. There's a place for jihad in Islam. Chowdhury is the leader of Islam for UK, a group recently banned in Britain under the country's counter-terrorism laws. He wants Islamic Sharia law to rule the United Kingdom and is working to make that dream a reality. He's seen here converting a 10-year-old British boy to Islam. Islamic radicals in the United States are usually pretty savvy. They wear suits and ties. They speak, at least publicly, in moderate tones. But here in London, it's often a different story. Anjum Chowdhury has praised the 9-11 hijackers and called for the execution of Pope Benedict. Chattery told CBN News his group is a non-violent political and ideological movement that resides in the UK under a covenant of security. Yet he openly praises violent jihad. The Quran is full of, you know, jihad is the most talked about duty in the Quran after Tawheed, belief. Nothing else is, more, is mentioned more than the topic of fighting. Several former members of Chowdhury's group have been arrested on terrorism charges. A very significant number of, 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 of former al Mujahideen people were involved in terrorist plots against this country. A number of people have actually gone to Afghanistan, joined the Taliban and died fighting. Uh, for the Taliban. Chowdhury refuses to condemn acts of terror, including 9-11 and the July 7, 2005 London bombings, which killed 52 people. What were your thoughts on the 7-7 bombings? Did you condemn them? Did you support them? For the people who carried it out, it was legitimate. If you look at the will of Muhammad Sadiq Khan and Shijanat Anvir, they will justify and they will bring many verses from the Quran and many statements to say that that's the Islamic argument. And it's a difficult Islamic argument to refute. And there are many scholars who support that argument as well. Chowdhury says his group is merely following core Islamic teachings. He says Islam is much more than a religion. This particular uh, belief is more than just a religion. It's not just a spiritual belief. It is in fact an ideology which you believe in and you struggle for and you're willing even to die for because you believe in that. That is your whole life. He seems to relish being called Great Britain's most hated man, pledging to continue his rallies, calling for the overthrow of the British system. Coming up. Somali America, Black Hawk now, in the heart of the Bible Belt. Don't move. I always wore a mask. I would never let anyone see what I really felt inside. My whole life, all I wanted to hear was that I love you and I want you. I just realized all of the horrible things that I've done in the past to feel loved and accepted. It, they were fleeting. It didn't matter. The relationship that I wanted my whole life was right there for me. And it was Jesus. We created this website as a place where kids can learn the Bible in a whole new way. Kids will love Superbook.tv. Their games, the ability to create your own personal Superbook characters. We even have a place for kids to listen to music on Superbook Radio. Superbook is CBN's animated series that teaches the Bible through the eyes of two friends and their robot sidekick. We're going to tell stories all the way from creation to Christ's return. The website also teaches kids life lessons. Parents can spend time online with their kids learning about the Bible. Superbook and Superbook.tv are entirely gospel-centered. And by supporting it, you'll help bring God's Word to children all over the world. We're reaching a new generation with the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Together, we can give today's kids the truth of the Bible in a fun and exciting way that will change their lives. Visit Superbook.tv today. I had chased the record deal for years with no results. And then I let it go and I turn it over to him and then there it is. I want people to know that you can't be bad enough for God to not love you or forgive you or to give you a second chance. He doesn't give you the right to judge you, so stop there and learn to love you the way he loves you. And then you can enjoy life more than you've ever enjoyed it before. It's been 20 years since Somalia last had a functioning government. Islamic jihadists now control most of the country, and Sharia is the law of the land. The U.S. government has resettled tens of thousands of Somali refugees in recent years to help them escape the chaos of their homeland. But the transition isn't going smoothly in one small southern town. And it's stories like this that moved me to include a chapter in my book called Somali America, Black Hawk Now. At first glance, Shelbyville is your typical sleepy southern town. It's nestled in Middle Tennessee, where the walking horse is king. There's Main Street, the local sheriff, a movie theater. It's all very Mayberry, except for one big difference, the recent arrival of hundreds of Somali Muslims. This is small town USA, and like many Americans, People here knew little about Somalia other than the 1993 Black Hawk Down incident, in which 18 U.S. servicemen were killed while battling Islamic jihadists and warlords in the Somali capital of Mogadishu. So when hundreds of Somalis began turning up here in Shelbyville, many of them dressed in traditional Islamic garb, locals quickly took notice. They've had an impact here. Unfortunately, it's not been a good impact. Local columnist Brian Mosley won an award from the Associated Press for a series of articles he wrote about Shelbyville Somalis. There was just an enormous culture clash going on here. Um, the uh, Somalis were, according to many of the people I've talked to here, were being very, very rude and considerate, being very demanding. Uh, they would go into stores and uh, haggle over prices. Their culture is totally alien to anything that uh, the folks here are used to. The problems extend to local schools, where some Somali students won't talk to female administrators. There's also been issues with local law enforcement. And I'm not really sure if that's because of their experiences with the police in their country, or if that's just the way their culture is. Shelbyville is home to about 17,000 people. The town's Somali population is estimated between 400 and 1,000. Mosley says the Somalis have isolated themselves from the rest of the community. We're talking about people that have not had any experience uh, with Western civilization. They don't know the language. Uh, things like running water are a miracle. Abdurazak Hassan is director of the Somali Community Center in nearby Nashville. He says the state of Tennessee has no programs to help immigrants integrate into their new surroundings. They come and the only thing they can do is to go to work from work to, to apartment, they're totally isolated. The State Department helps resettle refugees from war-torn countries like Somalia here in the United States. The resettlement project is one part of a taxpayer-funded refugee aid program with a billion-dollar budget. Immigrants are chosen from UN refugee camps. The selected refugees then undergo a few days of cultural orientation and are on their way to America. The U.S. takes in more refugees than any other country, with a cap of about 80,000 this year. What we do is we look at the most vulnerable groups of refugees. Todd Pierce works for the State Department's Bureau of Population, Refugees and Migration. He says the resettlement program helps America's image in the eyes of the world. It's one of the best facets of, of America is that we're a very generous, hospitable country. And this is something that's been bipartisan for decades now we've brought people in. More than 150,000 Somalis now live in the United States, most in larger cities like Minneapolis, Nashville and Seattle. Gang activity has been a major concern and according to government reports at least a dozen young Somali Americans have returned home to join Islamic terrorist groups. The FBI is conducting investigations in several cities with large Somali populations. After a few months in their settlement cities, the refugees are free to move around the country. Somalis in other cities were drawn to Shelbyville by the jobs offered at the local Tyson chicken plant. 
The plant came under fire from the Justice Department in 2001 for hiring illegal Hispanic immigrants. The large influx of Somalis has only added to locals' frustration with the plant and the government. Despite locals' continued complaints about Tyson's hiring practices, the company says it's doing things by the book. Tyson reps say they're simply following federal employment guidelines and that most of their employees are local residents. The Tyson plant generated national controversy last fall when it dropped Labor Day as a paid holiday in favor of the Muslim holiday Eid al-Fitr. The decision was later reversed, but longtime local residents say the incident was symbolic of the larger changes taking place in Shelbyville, changes they're coping with as best they can. We're probably as cultural diversified as any small town in America, I would think. Uh, and it's been a lot of change, but I think most people pretty much take it in stride and just keep, keep going along. We're coming up. Why I wrote the terrorist next door and what I hope it accomplishes for our cause and our country. Stay tuned. Fresh, wholesome juice. There's nothing like it. But until now, you had to stress and strain and make a huge mess to get just a little bit of juice. But not anymore, thanks to the Jack LaLanne Power Juicer. You can drop in whole vegetables, whole fruits, apples, oranges, celery, cucumbers with no chopping, no slicing, no struggling. And thanks to the Power Juicer's revolutionary patented extraction technology, you can get up to 30% more juice than those other juicers. Doctors recommend we get five to nine servings of fruits and vegetables every day. With the Power Juicer, you'll be drinking your recommended daily allowance in just seconds and the pulp from the extra large pulp catcher can be used to make pasta sauces healthy desserts and much more the power juicer is dishwasher safe so cleanups a breeze and the powerful motor is guaranteed for life order the jack lalane power juicer now for just two easy payments of 49.90 and as part of this special tv offer we'll also send you this amazing recipe guide filled with over 60 of jack's favorite recipes try the jack lalane power juicer in your home risk-free for 30 days if you're not completely satisfied send it back for a full refund of the purchase price no questions asked call now I was always on the cusp of exploding. So I figured out if I get rid of the wife and the kids, then I can just send them money. Went to the junk drawer, got the Bible out, put the tape in, and I believe that moment, that moment, Christ made sense. There is no earthly reason why we're still married. It is a divine intervention. And I thank God, thank God, and showing me what love, grace, and forgiveness looks like. I had chased the record deal for years with no results. And then I let it go and I turned it over to him and then there it is. I want people to know that you can't be bad enough for God to not love you or forgive you or to give you a second chance. He doesn't give you the right to judge you, so stop there and learn to love you the way he loves you. And then you can enjoy life more than you've ever enjoyed it before. No, I had compiled so many first-hand, on-the-ground experiences covering the global jihad over the past 10 years that it was a real thrill to finally tie them all together into one book. The Terrorist Next Door, How the Government is Deceiving You About the Islamist Threat. It was also a great opportunity to be able to get all of my thoughts and observations about the Islamist enemy and how to defeat it on paper for a wide audience. The more I wrote, the more I realized just how extensive my experiences were. And worse, just how entrenched Islamic radicals are in the very fabric of America. I'm honored to be able to contribute to the ongoing discussion on how to save our country from what is truly an existential jihadist threat. Send all of your questions and comments about the show to stackonterror at gmail.com. Until next time, make sure you pick up my new book, The Terrorist Next Door, and keep it right here as we report on the advancing global jihad that's in your backyard. Until next time, take care. God bless you.